Um, connect to the server. Will let me record. New screen recording. Let's see. Yes, I think it might. Just minimize this. Maximize this. Hey, everybody. <laughs> we are here. We are Cesar and Pam. Hi. With CesarandPam.com. You can live the life you dreamed of, a life of freedom. And we have two subjects we're going to cover today. And the first subject is a question that a dear friend of ours asked us when she watched one of our previous videos. And just as a reminder, we have a business, an online business in the travel industry. But we also, we, uh, our motto is we want to help you grow your business and achieve your dreams without having you sell your soul, your family, or your health in order to grow your business or achieve your dreams. We believe that it's actually through being a good steward of the resources that God, that God gave you, including your relationships in your life, that you can accomplish those dreams. So within that, we talk about finances in the home, health in the home, uh, parenting, homeschooling. We have six kids and uh, also business questions and answers. Just send us your, uh, send us your questions. Uh, for us, our life didn't really change a whole lot because we run a we work from home, but um, now in this situation with the coronavirus and the quarantine, we are experiencing uh, a lot of um, a lot of people in our lives that are going through a lot of stress. So we want to help you on the second part of this uh, thirty-minute live. But on the first part of the live, we want to um, answer questions. answer the question from Gabrielle, and the question said, uh, "This was so good. Thank you for sharing." I love what you said about letting kids get bored, but I find they start picking on each other when they don't have, they don't know what to do. Any thoughts for that? They are seven, five, three, and one years old. The seven-year-old is the worst in disturbing at disturbing others when he is bored. Pam? Well, I had some thoughts. I know that Gabrielle has, I'm pretty sure her oldest ones are boys and we have five boys. So I was thinking about how our oldest is a girl and we moved um, to Texas from Mexico when she was four and CJ was two and my sister was living here and she has two boys, my two nephews that are older. Um, they were like mm, four or five and six um and seven and seven mm -hmm. anyways so my my little guy you know it was the first time i realized when he would go over to, there to play that he started playing cowboys and indians and wanted to have guns and bows and arrows and gi joes and it was like a whole new world of these boy toys and i realized that i hadn't even like i was thinking well maybe we won't buy you know guns we, we might not be like wanting boy wanting to have guns oh no like if you don't buy guns they're gonna make guns out of something with their finger <laughs> yeah because um you know and you have talks about stuff like this obviously but what i want to say is sometimes the creativity that boys have is outside of the, the mom box, you know? And lots of times it involves adventures and things that we think are dangerous. So sometimes we're like trying to protect. And it could be because your seven-year-old is the oldest and there's younger siblings that he's in a pretty like safe world and maybe he needs some challenges. And sometimes that's just more outdoors time. And I'm not saying don't give him anything to do. It could be, I need you guys to dig this hole. I remember we had a fence that was too far forward. It should have been a few feet back. So we decided to take that back fence out. And really it was my daughter. <laughs> and I and the boys were younger that decided when Cesar couldn't help us to do it, but it was a lot of hard work. And then we wanted to plant some trees. So we needed four big holes for these trees. And it turned out that the boys, they thought that was the best. Like they were digging holes, like they dug deeper than we needed because they wanted to be able to get down in the hole and nobody could see them. And so their imagination went wild. They were playing games. Um, and it was hard work to make that game work, you know, but 
but they were having fun. So it could be that you need a place in your yard that's not going to be beautiful, <laughs> but it's going to be they've been digging holes, you know, and they come up with ideas and make forts. Um, it could be with hammer and nails. And I'm not saying, you know, that the younger ones can handle that, but you may need to think of some things that the older one can do that aren't totally safe, you know. Um, I was also remembering you used to, when, when uh, my nephews lived here in Texas and I had the baby, I, Nico was born, um, he would take the older ones, well, they were, they were so little, you know, like your five and seven year old Gabrielle, and they would go on these excursions. And we had this um, nature preserve right by our house. So they would go like over an hour, a couple hours sometimes. And they would come back from those excursions just like sweaty and muddy. I mean, one time, one of them came back with only one shoe and they had a story how they were like in the creek and there was all this mud and it was like quicksand and it was sucking their feet and their legs down in and they had to finally get it out, but they lost their shoe. And then they're climbing up the banks of the creek and uh, with the roots and things. And they love to come home and tell these stories about their adventures. So they have a lot of energy and it could be that you know, they need more time, dad, take them out, you know, take the older ones and, and plan some things, a, a bike ride that's further than you would be able to go with them with the little ones, you know, things that are, are, are going to push them a little. Yeah. I think, love it. I think God created us to face challenges, especially men to overcome those challenges. Sometimes you're going to win. Sometimes you're going to lose. But there's always a mountain in front of you that God designed you to climb. So for little boys, yeah, I think that definitely they need to have a challenge every day of some sort. And as they get older, uh, that requires some, some uh, physical effort. Yeah, I remember looking out the window and seeing that we have another family with boys. And so my youngest two were always with those, at least two of the neighbor boys. And... I look out there on the trampoline. Well, they're not just jumping on the trampoline. They had gotten a ladder and they were climbing on top of the fort, jumping over the, the net onto the trampoline. And I was like, oh my gosh, is that okay? And I Stace went out there and he decided it was okay. I was sure this is not okay. This is too dangerous, you know, but um, sometimes, yeah, it's just kind of crazy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, be encouraged just figure out where he, what he can do so he can spend his energy and overcome yeah. in some way. Yeah, and, and when we said like, it's good to be bored, I think we were referring to that we don't always want to entertain them with technology because that, like that, they won't be bored. They'll sit for two hours with that thing, but we need to train them to be able to have something else. So sometimes that means, um, you know, I've seen really good ideas of having tubs of certain blocks or toys that aren't just always out, but there's a certain time of the day where you get out one and they know that this is their time to play with that. So they can be creative and not be bored with that one thing. So it's not that they don't have anything to do, but maybe you can plan um, constructive things, you know, or the, they can be working with these arts and crafts things or these tools and nails and this board, you know, something to do, but you don't have to be there necessarily. Boom. Okay. Next question. That's enough because we've already <laughs> go longer than we needed to on that. So the second thing is a lot of you are feeling overwhelmed right now with so much information and the news and the media and people that you talk to. And maybe you're part of a Facebook group or a WhatsApp chat or something or Instagram where you just keep feeding information your, to your brain and you're becoming overwhelmed. Um, here's the deal. I'm gonna, we're going to give you three points in what you can do to practically be able to improve that situation. I just saw an Instagram post from somebody today that said, you know how that saying that says, don't believe everything you hear? Well, this one said, don't believe everything you think. And Dr. Car Caroline Leaf, that's an, another uh, Another person that I follow on Instagram, she wrote a book called Who Moved My Brain. Talks about how you can determine the pathways of your brain. You can actually create new pathways and you can actually change the way your brain is wired electrically or chemically by what you think. Choices are actually, the thoughts are actually choices uh, that you make on what, what you meditate on. I think that's a powerful concept that, I, that, I, uh, that I've been thinking about recently. 
whatever you start, you can't avoid, you can't stop a bird from st standing on your head, but you can't stop him from building a nest on there. Whenever you have a thought and you give it some emotion and start letting it go, it uh, conceives something. What are you conceiving? You're giving birth to something intellectually, emotionally, even spiritually. I, I, I heard from our pastor on a message that he shared that whatever you think will be multiplied. Mosquitoes, mosquitoes multiply quickly. Only the females bite, or how do you say it? bite, right? Sting. Sting, sting sorry. Sting. Well, they bite. Okay. I mean, it's sting. But for one drop of blood, they can lay 100 eggs. So one drop of blood from you, you just fathered 100 mosquitoes. What are you creating, right? What are you co-creating with that thought that you allowed into your mind? We need to vow to focus on what is right and not, not focus on what is wrong, especially on things that you cannot control. Um, something that we've observed and all, and all the people that have achieved great things in life, from Steve Jobs to uh, Bill Gates, who created empires in the computing world, in the personal computing world. Um, I can't get into it right now, but I've been reading about one of their number one qualities is that they could focus on one thing for a very long time. So what are you focusing on? On the positive or, or the negative? If you focus on the, on the negative long enough, you will give birth to a victim mentality, to a victim mindset that says, the outside obstacles, are, they're too big for me to overcome. I'm just not enough to do it. We already struggle enough with what we say to ourselves. What are you saying to yourself? Versus if you start focusing on empowering thoughts, on positive thoughts, on life-giving thoughts, uh, you start to develop a mindset of victory. You are victorious. You are not a victim. Do you have anything to say before we get into the scriptures that I want to share? No? no okay. That's good. So meditate daily in God's faithfulness in your life. Meditate daily on how grateful you are to have a spouse if you have a spouse, to have a family if you have a family, to be alive if you are, you are alive because you're listening to this. If you haven't been able to eat and have shelter up until today, be grateful for that. Number one, Philippians 4, 6 through 9, fix your thoughts. Where? It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So that's number one. Focus on the right stuff. And number two, which is closely related, get the robber out of your house. If a robber comes into your house and you know that they want to destroy you, they want to take away things from from that belong to you they want to damage your property in your family you're not going to invite them and have some coffee with you in the kitchen no you're going to force forcefully remove that threat that's the way you need to think about what you put into your mind every day second corinthians 10 4 through 5. can i just say something about yeah. that you know it's like if your child tells you that they're afraid what are you going to tell them? Are you going to give them all the reasons why they should be afraid? And, oh, have you thought of this? Um, what about this? It could get really bad. It could, no, you don't do that. It goes on to say in Philippians, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And that's what we do with our kids. You know, we say, no, that, focus on this. This is the truth. This is something beautiful to think about. Let's think about this thing. You know, and we take, we, we get rid of that thought and we replace it with something else. And, um, you know, that's okay. what I Thoughts dwelled on are thoughts that end up dwelling in you. When you are entertaining a thought, you are conceiving something. Are you conceiving a beautiful child that is going to be productive and is going to grow up to be an adult, figuratively speaking? Or are you conceiving a monster that is going to destroy your world in some way? <clears throat> Let me just give you one thought before you read that. Um, right now, there's so much information about, number one, about the medical situation with the coronavirus. And number two, about the economic implications of the layoffs and people not working. It's definitely going to affect our economy. 
But what you focus on is going to really determine your mental state. Some people, and I'm talking to a couple of friends right now, uh, one of them is saying that this is going to be the worst depression since the Great Depression. It's going to be close to World War II economy. Like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. Wait a second. If you read the same article that you're telling me that you're quoting this expert who acts like has a crystal ball about the future, the same expert is saying, we don't know to what, to what extent this is going to go. So stop predicting the future for something that is not even over yet. Yes, we know it's, gonna be, it's not going to be the way it was last week. The economy is not going to recover quickly. But at the same time, do not prophesy death because whatever you prophesy is going to happen. So be very careful of uh, what information you dwell on because of what it says here. Yeah, um, it's talking about that we're not, it's, this isn't a war just in the world, like in what we see physically, there's a spiritual war going on for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Demolish. The, the word, uh, our pastor was sharing a message. That's where we're getting some of the thoughts we're, we're going to share with you today. He was sharing a message where he said, the word demolish means to remove with force. Ask yourself, what would you do if fear, despair, anger were ro robbers in your home? You would announce, you're not welcome. And you would take action immediately. So what do you do? You meditate in God, on God's word. Yeah. That's how you kick him out. Be aggressive with those thoughts. Get him out of there. <laughs> like That just helps to think those are robbers. They're coming in to destroy your peace. You know, kick them out. Don't sit down and have coffee with them. We're reading um, uh, the Old Testament right now as a family, the Old Testament challenge. And we're in the book of 2 Samuel. And right there intersects with, uh, I'm reading what, what everybody's reading, but intersects with, with First Chronicles and with the book of Psalms. And I'm also reading uh, what Psalms David wrote during that time. Oh, man, so it's so good just to see the perspective that David had during that turmoil, the time of turmoil, right when Saul was persecuting him and he ended up going, uh, working and living with the, with the enemy for a while. And he only had a bunch of rebels with him, afraid of being captured every day. The same people that he wanted to serve were against him. And then during that transition, when, when a king Saul dies and they're going to make him king, what is he thinking during this turmoil situation? Because it was not easy. Even when that happened, it wasn't going to be easy because not everybody was going to be against him from the other side. And David. It, David, yeah, to David. So I, just, I want to encourage you to have a strategy every morning. Don't just mind, mindlessly wake up and turn on your phone and go to the news. Do not do that. Do not mindlessly go check your text and your notifications and your Instagram and your Facebook and your WhatsApp. And you don't know what influences are allowing into your mind. Be very cautious. Make sure you have uh, some foundation of what your day is going to be like by listening or reading scripture first thing in the morning. Yeah, that's good. I will, we were talking with our older sons and they were asking about Y2K. And they wanted to know, like, were we preparing for Y2K? And what did we think? What was Y2K, honey? Yeah. For those, for the young people, don't know what we're <laughs> talking year about. The year 2000. And it's funny because they were giving me a history lesson. I lived through it. But they were telling uh, the younger boys, like, what Y2K was, what, what was going on. And I couldn't even give their explanation. They are explaining how... Computers weren't set to go to the number 2000. And so there was this fear about everything just totally shutting down. And it's funny because I thought, wow, I didn't even know all that. And I lived through it. But part of it is there wasn't social media. <laughs> you know, we didn't have Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, you know, informing us every second of everything we needed to think about. There was the news, but we were at that time, we had decided not to watch the news, that we were gonna fill our minds with, with things that, that were positive. And so we didn't really watch, I mean, we knew what was going on. My mom sent me a book like about canning and like being prepared, but it was kind of like, I was pregnant 
Nico, my 20 year old was going to be born in January of 2000. And well, we thought February, he was born early, but he was born in January. Like I was thinking about taking care of the two kids I had and being pregnant and having a baby. And I really don't remember. I mean, I remember thinking about it, but we, you didn't, I didn't give it that much thought because I couldn't. It was like, there was enough to think about today. And that's what the Bible says. Don't worry about tomorrow. Um, each day has enough to worry about. <laughs> you know, take care of today. You can't solve the problems for tomorrow. Um, so. Check out this um, picture that somebody shared with me that I found so useful. This picture shows um, what do you do what do I want to be during the COVD-19 time? Do you want to be in the fear zone, in the learning zone, or in the growth zone? And let me see if I can somehow minimize this. Um, how do I do this? How do I do this? I did it last time. I know, but it's not, it's not letting me drag. Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is, okay. Okay, fear zone, number one. Number one, what happens during, if you're in the fear zone? I go and grab food, toilet paper, and medications that I don't even need. Number two, I spread emotions related to fear and anger. Number three, I complain frequently. Number four, I forward all messages I receive. Number five, I get mad easily. This is you. Maybe you're in the fear zone. You need to jump into the learning zone. Learning zone. Number one, I start to give up what I can't control. I stop compulsively consuming what hurts me from food to news. I identify my emotions. I become aware of the situation and think how to act. I evaluate information before spreading something false. Mm. I recognize that we are all trying to do our best. That's the learning zone. Are you in that zone? Maybe you need to go to the next zone, the growth zone. Go ahead, honey, read those. I think, uh, I think of others and see how to help them. I make my talents available to those who need them. I live in the present and focus on the future. I am empathetic with myself and with others. I thank and appreciate others. I keep a happy emotional state and spread hope. I look for a way to adapt to, to new changes. I practice quietude, patience, relationships, and creativity. So, where are you? Let's all shoot to be in the growth zone. How about that? Yeah, and sometimes, you know, you find yourself in the fear zone. And like say mm -hmm. said, some, a lot of times it was like, it wasn't your idea, but somebody okay. told you, like, do you know that you can't get toilet paper? And so you freak out and you feel like you have to go to 10 stores and find toilet paper or order 80 rolls online like I did, but then it didn't show up. You know, it's like you, you act on things and you don't even realize, but if we're aware that there is a fear zone and that we can go out of it, that, that we can be in the learning zone, we can be um, in the growth zone, we can be blessing other people. You know, when you're afraid, you're all focused on yourself. And that is the worst. I mean, God does, doesn't want that, you know? We focus on the Lord and we get filled by him so that we can be a blessing to others. I love that. You know, we should be in a position to be thinking about others right now, especially when there are people that don't know how to get out of that fear zone. We can be the ones like bringing them out, rescuing people. Yes. Our pastor shared a message that was really powerful and he, he was talking about how he got into the storage room looking for something in the church. And while he was in there, he started to realize that, man, I can't see anything. I wish I had a, a flashlight with me. And then he thought, oh, I have my phone. <laughs> so when he started, when he turned on the light and he realized he had a phone, his attention was where he was aiming. He was no longer afraid. And I'm going to turn on my flashlight. Go ahead. Go ahead. He no longer was afraid. Why? Because he was focusing where the light was. And all of a sudden, where all the, all the potential danger where he was afraid to maybe hit his head or trip over something was no longer a concern because there was a light in his path. That makes me think of God's word. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I mean, that's the first thing we can do is go to God's word. And he's going he's gonna to light up the path for us. Think about whatever is worthy of praise 
whatever is, uh, did you read that? Yeah, right? I did. Okay. What's true, right, noble, lovely, good report, you know, See, it's praiseworthy. Think about those things. God doesn't just show up. God is already here. Sometimes we just don't perceive him. It's like the, that story of the grandma and the grandpa, they were driving a pickup truck and they, they, were, they got to a stoplight and they, next to them there was another pickup truck with a young couple and the girl was sitting up all close to the guy and then the grandma looked at, at them and they looked at the grandpa and, say, and she said, hmm, we used to do that, we don't do that anymore. And the grandpa said, well, who moved? I've been behind the wheel the whole time. You're the one that moved. I have a question, whenever you, if you don't feel God close to you, moved it's us it's us that move our sight away from who he is make a declaration of faith whatever you're facing right now in your life in your family in your work turn on the flashlight and pray god help me aim my light on you set me free from negative thoughts your power is greater than my negativity set me free from depression set me free from loneliness set me free from worry set me free from stress set me free from anxiety help me now to be intentional and stay focused on you i just heard a friend say my friend Kristen say that god doesn't give peace he is peace mm. and i was reading in john about abiding mm. in christ in the vine God wants us in relationship with him. And when we're in that relationship, we have peace because we have him with us. You know, we know we're not alone. We know we don't need to be afraid. So, so thanks for logging in today. Shine the light, focus on the light, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Follow us on cesarandpam.com. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. We want to teach you how you don't have to sell your soul, your family, or your health to grow your business and achieve your dreams. <laughs> See you, next you can live, live the life you've dreamed a life of freedom see you later